very excited to join you. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, my name is Fadi Abro. I manage the automotive business for uh, Stratasys in the Americas, which of course includes uh, North and South America. My team works with the major OEMs, uh, be it small or big, as well in uh, the recreational vehicle space, the agricultural space, and then of course down into the supply chain for, for all those types of organizations. So diversity of work, mostly focused on manufacturing, uh, been in the additive industry for about 10 years. Um, and once again, I'm very excited to talk to you guys. Today, we're going to talk about two things that I'm very passionate about automotive and additive, otherwise known as 3D printing. We're going to talk about the trends in these two industries, um, and we're going to make some, um, uh, we're going to get a better understanding of where these two industries are going and ultimately realize how they fit in and dovetail together. Um, we'll start with the automotive piece, of course. There are some uh, unavoidable, unavoidable trends that we're seeing happening right now. If you look at the industry as a whole, it is undoubtable that the uh, entire uh, industry is shifting towards electrification. So electric vehicles have been a commitment for automotive companies for quite some time. It seems that there has been a really uh, recent acceleration towards that mission and towards that goal. So much so that if you take all the mission statements of all these organizations, large, small, 30 years old, 100 years old, 2 years old, they are all saying the same thing. They are all moving towards sustainability. They're moving towards a lower impact on the earth. They want to create a better societal impact better eco fit in better into our ecosystem all the way down into the minerals that are um, uh, required to make the vehicles the batteries etc uh, ultimately resulting in a goal of zero emissions zero crashes these are the things that these organizations care about today they've been caring about them for a long time but uh, i believe that covid has really uh, given these organizations clarity that they otherwise didn't have so of course, you're impacted so uh, immensely by a worldwide pandemic that provides focus. And in this case, we are seeing some laser focus from these organizations towards electrification as well. Some huge commitments to go fully electric for an entire fleet of an organization like GM, uh, you know, within the next uh, 10, 20 years. So this is a very... Uh, impactful, meaningful change, and it doesn't come without pain. Uh, of course, there are some trends that we can point to that are happening in the automotive industry that will help this um, shift towards electri electrification, autonomy, and other things. One of the biggest trends we're seeing today with our big OEMs, um, as well as our small OEMs, is you have to be nimble. If you want to be in this electric game, you have to be nimble. And, and admittedly, the innovation and the pace of that innovation is being set by the smaller companies, by the startups, by the, um, the organizations that have emerged in the past 10 years or so. And so you as an organization, whether you're on the supply base at the OEM level, you're probably noticing the shift where there's now a culture of innovation because of the pace um, that is set by the smaller guys towards uh, doing things differently than rather than doing things um, as, as we've typically done them. Of course, that, um, that ability to be nimble doesn't just address innovation, it also can address the customer's um, ever-changing mindset on the trends of automotive. So, there is undoubtedly an innovation, or I'm sorry, uh, uh, an anxiety towards EVs, um, you know, otherwise known as range anxiety. People are afraid, I'm going to run out of battery, I'm going to run out of juice in the middle of a vehicle. So how, how can your organization be nimble enough to help address some of that, um, whether that's through infrastructure, whether that's through um, sort of communication to customers, different technologies that will get you further uh, distances, that kind of thing. And then, of course, there's the uh, need to stay nimble as we talk about the changing standards. Um, it's, it's no secret that from administration to administration, from party to party, there's changes in the way 
um, that uh, that uh, government leadership and government impact could create changing standards for these organizations. So while you're heading down a path, uh, there might be credits that that change your mind. There might be incentives that change your mind. So those are the kinds of things that we're seeing from automotive companies is they are always on their toes and they're always staying nimble. So it is a much different way to look at the world than we have looked at for the past 30 years of of simply let's refine the way we're doing it so we can get more efficient. We're now on our toes uh, being as nimble as we possibly can. Another mega trend, and, and remember I'm talking about these as mega trends that, that are made up of small little trends but ultimately fit into this puzzle. We are seeing some, some more strategic intent than we've really seen in the past. It used to be that you want to mass market your vehicle. You want to take a vehicle that will work in uh, the deserts of Arizona and in northern in the winters of northern Canada and try to have as minimal variation as possible so you can produce sort of the similar types of vehicles that will play in almost every market that you have. We're seeing a big shift away from that. Uh, companies are marketing to specific markets. So um, uh, a vehicle in the Midwest might need to um, resemble a truck and uh, a vehicle in New York or in China might need to have um, a, a little bit of a smaller footprint. So these market-specific activities um, are informing these big OEMs and the small guys so that they can market to the right locations with the right product. We are all hungering for custom, um, uh, custom experiences, and the automakers are going to deliver on that. They're heading down that path. Um, another piece of sort of understanding your market is the infrastructure. If you have a, um, a very powerful 200 mile range vehicle, maybe that is not ideal for a place that is very uh, low density or has, has really long distances between major population centers. Um, maybe a better option is, is to have a, a longer distance battery for that type of experience where you might be 400 miles away from the next town. Um, and so, so the market and location means everything to these folks today. And that is really impactful and different than the way we've seen it before. And the third, the third um, uh, bullet point there is accessibility, something that we don't talk enough about, which is how does the EV space play into accessibility for those who are handicapped, differently abled, where does that where does that market play? And that is currently being thought about in a way that is different than before, because of course with an EV, you actually have much more capability uh, within the vehicle. You have this battery, you're not dependent um, on converting you know, a 12 volt battery into, into some energy source in the vehicle. You have a really powerful energy source in the vehicle that can lend itself to different applications. And, and we're hoping to see some advancements on that front. Another mega trend that we're seeing is technical skill set. The, the, this is sort of a challenge right now that the technical skill set is not exactly available to the auto OEMs and the suppliers as it pertains to the things that we're talking about, whether it's EV, whether it's innovation, um, whether it's completely different way to think about designing, dif different way to think about lightweighting, expertise in battery technology, where the minerals come from, how they're put together, where they're weighted in the car. All of these things are technical skill sets that are fairly sparse throughout, um, throughout the globe. And so it used to be that, you know, the industrial engineer was really king inside of automotive. That person was in charge of reducing cycle time, speeding up the way that an operator might do a certain, uh, perform a certain operation um, that will of course continue to be important, but these are some other skill sets now that we need for people to sort of um, uh, think differently. Uh, and, and one of the last trends is just customization, personalization. We are differentiating um, in, in the EV space, we are seeing differentiation that will help drive adoption. Um, I'm probably, um, 
you know, it's regional specific, but certainly the price of vehicles, or I'm sorry, the price of gasoline has made it so that you can go get a vehicle that maybe consumes a little bit more gas than you would have, um, you know, in, in, in uh, 2010, 2012. The vehicle um, efficiencies of internal combustion engines are improving. So therefore, what will be your motivation to go buy an electric vehicle today? There has to be some differentiator uh, built into that, and, and we're seeing that through customization. Um, of course, style is, is a meaningful thing. You can think about what Tesla's doing, uh, positioning itself as sort of a luxury brand. Um, and then just luxury features in general. How do we, uh, how do these EV makers make it so that you and I, the general consumer, want to make this leap into the EV? What kind of custom experience are you going to give us? Um, I mentioned the Phoenix Desert versus Northern Canada winters. Those are different experiences and might require a really customized vehicle, um, even down to your personal hobbies, whether that's camping, ice fishing, or what have you. If you're not familiar with this, this is the Gardner hype curve. EVs are following this hype curve. Um, uh, I'm sorry if you've seen this before. It's kind of a tired graph that gets applied to a lot of industries. And what, what really cracks me up about it is it very much applies to the additive industries. We, in 2014, um, were sort of uh, an emerging... Uh, we, we had been around for a long time as additive companies, but we were just sort of mentioned out there uh, by, uh, by certain leaderships. And all of a sudden, we really blew up and, and, and everyone thought, oh, we're going to have a 3D printer in everyone's home and we're not ever going to need traditional manufacturing again. It's all going to be additively made. And of course, that's not the case. So um, I share this because it, it's interesting to me that we are following sort of the same hype curve and additive as EVs are sort of starting to plateau into a realistic place in the market. So all of that all of those trends really boil down into that we have to automakers are thinking outside the box that we're trying to remove as many boundaries as possible so what is a way to remove boundaries that exist today the best way <laughs> is of course through additive well additive fits into three buckets so when we're talking about 3d printing and we're talking about automotive where's the overlap there's really three buckets one is product development. Product development, and you'll see some applications in the next slide, product development is about verifying your design, making sure things fit, making sure things look good, making sure that um, what you have set out to accomplish aesthetically is uh, coming to life and is, what you, is the direction you want to go. Companies are doing this across the board. This is a well-known um, advantage of having additive in your plant. It saves companies millions in issues down the line to be able to do to be able to do fit ups and and, and, um, and uh, design verification in a way that makes sure you don't make mistakes down the line. The other bucket is supporting the process, so manufacturing aids, jigs, fixtures, uh, hand tools, assembly tools, gauges. These are all things that cost companies millions of dollars today to make in a traditional methods such as aluminum machining and um, uh, other kind of uh, fabrication methodologies. Well, a lot of major OEMs have invested heavily in additive to make sure that they can solve problems on the manufacturing floor by printing tooling, by printing manufacturing aids. So this is a bucket where we're seeing a lot of adoption in additive today because it's such a no-brainer. You're able to take um, a, a traditionally made fixture, tool, hand tool, gauge that costs you thousands of dollars and you're able to print it for maybe as much as 10% of that traditional cost, also in about 10% of the traditional time that it takes. So you have a problem on your factory floor, you find a, you find a solution using a 3D printed hand tool or assembly fixture or a gauge, you can set that on your printer, go home, come back the next morning, and that tool's there. You're not waiting four to six weeks for um, a fabricator to come up with something for you. And then lastly, the production bucket. This is the one everyone jumps to, right? Everyone hears additive, they think, okay, I no longer need traditional manufacturing methodologies, let me just jump right to production. 
Um, and the truth of the matter is production is in sight. We are seeing production applications, um, certainly in aerospace where the volumes are low. Um, we're seeing a lot of applications. The materials themselves are production capable. It's just in automotive, we're dealing with a high volume and uh, a really, um, uh, really aggressive requirement for speed that additive is just not there yet. So what we're seeing is as more customization comes in, as some of these low volumes um, come in, that's where additive is gonna play a, a role in the production. And we'll take a look at each one of these buckets. These are really the three buckets. To look at them more um, you know, in terms of, of actual benefits and applications and use cases, again, product development is all about concept modeling. You're verifying your data before you go to production. Tooling, as we call it, is about manufacturing aids. You maybe can make some uh, sacrificial tooling. You can even print a quick one-off injection mold. So we've done some of those kind of unique things, but ultimately tooling is being used for um, uh, the things I mentioned, hand tools, end of arm tools, those kinds of things. And then again, production parts is really about on-demand service. It's, it's really about eliminating, um, uh, eliminating the need for tooling and expanding the need for customization. Not all AM uh, is created equal. Um, and that is not to say that one is bad or one is good. It's just that they have different uses. The same way that um, a three-row SUV has a different function than a Corvette, right? You you um, you will buy the product that serves your needs. So these products all exist in the market today, whether the Stratasys or not. These products all exist in the market today and they are serving different needs. So I'll break this down as sort of as simply as we can in this format. You have really four major polymer technologies. You have powder and DLP, which is excellent for high volume, small parts. And then you have FDM, which is excellent for large parts that are um, functional. Then you have Polyjet and SL on the bottom, and those two technologies are really good for concept modeling. So the bottom part of the graph, Polyjet and SL, really quick print times, um, really nice surface finish, high fidelity, will look very pretty, will be perfect for a conceptual kind of application. And then on top, you have the more functional, actual end use kind of um, uh, technologies, which is powder, DLP, and FDM. And then uh, from left to right, you can sort of see the size increase as you need a bigger part FDM is going to, as you need a bigger, more functional part, FDM is going to be more ideal. As you need maybe a smaller conceptual part, Polyjet might be more ideal. Now, I will say um, Stratasys has a solution for all these buckets. We'll go through that later. But this is how the industry sort of understands additive today. The additive industry understands additive today. Uh, and this is how we would position different geometries as they come to us. Um, so if you think of sort of tooling and manufacturing support, like a huge jig and fixture, a huge end of arm tool, an assembly tool, maybe FDM is perfect. If you think of a little button or connector or unique customized, um, you know, three inch piece that needs to go into your dashboard for a certain market or uh, a certain locale, maybe powder or DLP is the best option uh, from a production standpoint. So let's talk about product development. Um, and I'm gonna show you guys some applications here. We will do another uh, deep dive applications um, um, with Connor, but for now, I just wanna highlight some, some cases to, to help you understand what these buckets mean. So product development can be done anywhere in the vehicle. You want to see what is uh, what, what your production part is gonna look like. Um, the big change here in this in this industry, uh, in this part of the industry usage of additive, is that we have really upped the fidelity and the accuracy of the look. What you're seeing on the uh, left hand of your screen, the, the register vent, that is something that that uh, we can do with pretty much any technology, right? You can print a part that sort of looks like the part. What you're seeing on the right hand of your screen is new technologies that can print in full color, full texture. Um, if you look at that shifter knob, that is a single print. We take a file, we image map it um, with the wood grain look. We can tell the printer to make sure that the, um, the, the gripper leather looking part of the shifter knob is soft. We can add all that stitching and data and it prints just the way that you see it there. 
And what that does is it, is it, it increases and, and uh, further validates your design when you're going through the prototype phase. So huge advantages there, um, even though it is a place where automotive has used additive for a really long time, over 30 years. Stratasys is a 30 year old company. We've been working with the autos for 30 years, but this is what's new in this particular part of the market, the product development market. So you're able to feel it, you're able to see it, you're able to push those buttons, you're able to hold on to the to the part in a way that isn't just representative. It might it might be it might almost fool you. Um, and if you have a question about why wouldn't I just print this and put it in the car, it's really about the material properties. These high fidelity materials are typically UV curable resins, and so they look really pretty, but they just don't have that longevity. They will continue to degrade over time. Another application um, is here, this Audi lens. Um, it's really a beautiful part, and it's a, it's a part that's printed, again, as a single print in our PolyJet technology with the red, with the black, with the clear. You're not dealing with a, um, um, a situation where you have to sort of machine something or maybe urethane cast something and then paint it a bunch of different colors, really shortening up your product development cycle here. And of course, we do a lot of what we call surrogate parts. Uh, some people call them tryout parts. Uh, what you're seeing here is a large bumper, large roll cage. So you can print these really large things to do your not just your fit and verification, but you can also do that as a surrogate part uh, to prepare your factory floor for when the production parts show up. So um, that could that could include fixturing, racking, training your robots, training your staff. Uh, training your QC, so a lot of benefits to prototyping all the way up until the production parts show up, which of course includes this type of surrogate part. Now the other bucket that we talked about is tooling, jigs and fixtures. Uh, again, this is a bucket where a lot of companies have uh, realized, uh, sort of a light bulb was turned on, we could save a lot of money by putting a machine in our plant that will print jigs and fixtures on demand as we need them to help us improve the, um, the way that we do our business, improve our efficiency, in some cases improve ergonomics and safety. Um, there have been a lot of material developments in the industry. For us, this material, nylon 12 carbon fiber, has been really the game changer. It's five times stiffer than anything we've had on the market before, released about two, three years ago. Um, it's a nylon 12 base with chopped fiber in it, 35% um, chop fiber, 200 micron little fibers that are, um, uh, that help sort of with the stiffness. And of course, with the stiffness, you get a nice strength to weight ratio that opens up the application window for you. So this, this material has been a huge game changer for us. Um, and you'll see that in some of these applications. As we talk through the, the tooling world, where does this all fit in? Where, where in my factory, you might be asking yourself, can I, can I implement additive? And, and the truth of the matter is it can be everywhere. Um, if you're doing any kind of assembly work, you can make fixtures that make the assembly easier for those operators. If you want to try out some kind of tool before you go invest in a tool that will cycle hundreds of times or thousands or millions of times, you can print that to do your design verification a lot easier to iterate with a 3D printed tool um, than it is with a, some, some kind of steel tool or some, some aluminum welded fixture or that kind of thing. Quality control, gauges, uh, huge impact here. Really um, easy to print a fixture that holds a part in a certain way if you need to do some specific measurement. Uh, packaging and logistics, we're seeing a lot of that in terms of dunnage verification before mass production or even for production use depending on the volume. Health and safety, again, we're traditionally reducing weight with these types of applications so that improves the, the, uh, the uh, impact on the operator. And then end of arm tooling uh, has, been a, has been a big industry that we've been poking into to reduce the weight on the, ar on the, on the robotic arm which help drives cycle time and improve cycle time. You'll see that in an example here shortly. This is a uh, stud check fixture for KUKA working on a GM vehicle. So what you're seeing here is just a stud. It, this, this tool checks the studs in the sheet metal. Very um, simplistic tool. You know, you're talking about maybe a $30 fixture to print here, but it saves you from having to go get something machined on a five axis tool. Anything where complexity is high, 
additive is going to be a slam dunk because you are not penalized for complexity um, when you when you print something additively. Another example with GM that we worked on is this is a this is a hemming tool. So what you're seeing here in the picture is an off-white part. This off-white part is a guide for the hemming tool. And if you're not familiar, a hemming tool essentially takes two pieces of sheet metal and hems them together the same way that the bottoms of your pants are hemmed, just to give it a nice clean edge. So what, what GM was doing in this pre-production plant is machining this giant fixture for the hemming tool to ride on. It was aluminum, it was very heavy, required the lift assist, required two people, sometimes slammed into the car, took 10 to 13 weeks, cost 12 grand. They were able to replace that with a 3D printed part on our big, uh, on our big um, F900 platform. And it weighs a third, takes two weeks to print, it's a tenth of the price. Um, it's something that you can literally carry with one arm into the, into the right spot. Uh, bolt it in as they've done here and it does the function. Uh, very, very, very interesting application. And then an end of arm application. So this end of arm application, uh, what you're seeing here is sort of the before and after. Um, on the left hand of your screen is, is before welded steel tubing, machine details. Very, very heavy. 168 pound end of arm tool that was picking up a 15 pound part. So huge discrepancy between how robust the tool is versus um, the part that it was, it was picking up. So we worked with this company and their engineers and our engineers worked together to come up with what you see on the right hand side, which is fully printed uh, in our nylon 12 carbon fiber, fully printed end of arm tool. This thing just for scale is about two and a half feet um, and uh, reduce the weight by about 100 pounds. Um, it, which, of course, the robot can move faster if it has less weight on it. So that improved cycle time by about 19%. But if you just look at the one-to-one -one, um, uh, cost savings, you're still talking about a 30% cost savings. Um, again, would not have been possible in the past couple of years um, because of the stiffness requirements. But now with, with our carbon-filled material, we're really able to do things like this. So then jumping, of course, to production parts and spare parts, kind of the, the holy grail of additive, where we eventually want to get to with all industries, not just automotive. Uh, but again, with automotive, we are talking about low volume, high complexity, uh, really um, sort of uh, unique applications. This is an application for Siemens Mobility, um, where we printed uh, some bumper parts using our nylon material, uh, the unfilled nylon. You know, of course, we are pushing towards um, technologies that can scale up. Again, the material properties are there. It's just the volume um, at which we need parts and the volume at which traditional auto manufacturers that uh, additive is going to work on for the next five to 10 years. Um, but we are, uh, as you'll see here sort of in our portfolio, are investing, Stratasys is investing in companies that are um, dedicated to making parts faster. So let's look at the Stratasys portfolio. I'll, I'll walk you guys through kind of what we've done. There's some, been some recent announcements. I don't expect everyone tuning in here to keep up with the additive news. So I'll share with the team here what we've done as an organization uh, and, and how we're filling out the portfolio. The, the uh, Our thought process at Stratasys and our mission is to be the number one additive provider when it comes to polymers. But like you saw earlier, polymers isn't just a single unified application. There are applications in design, there's applications in engineering, there's manufacturing aids that we talked about, there's production, and those are all different tools because they're solving different problems. So as an industry, I showed you that grid earlier with SLA and PolyJet on top, they are solving design and engineering problems. Those two technologies live there. FDM is solving engineering problems and bleeding into manufacturing. Large scale FDM is able to do um, hundreds of parts for aerospace, uh, flame retardant materials, high temp, high heat materials. And then of course we have DLP um, and powder based technologies that are driving up the volumes into the thousands versus into the hundreds like some of the FDM technology. So these are the areas where 
additive is playing today, and these are the technologies that we would prescribe for these particular problems. So how does that overlap with the um, Stratasys offering? Uh, we are a polyjet company and an FDM company. That's sort of what we're known for. And so what we've done is gone out and acquired companies who are experts in some other technologies. Um, you may have heard recently that we've acquired RPS. They are an SLA company. Um, SL is a technology that is, um, that's been around for a really long time. Again, it's a UV curable resin. So it really lives in that design engineering space. Um, uh, and then to, to, to fill the production gap, we've actually, we actually have two things to announce. One, um, is our acquisition of Origin, uh, which is a DLP technology. This technology can make really fine featured parts really, really fast with amazing material properties. This is a very exciting push towards production. And then the other thing that we have going is a partnership with a company called Czar, who specializes in powder technologies. Again, powder is all about that high volume, high throughput, uh, really functional components. So. As an organization, we want to go to the automotive market with solutions in each of these buckets because they are all problems. There isn't one problem here. There is multiple problems across your organizations um, and across your customers' organizations that are being solved by these technologies. And um, we're committing to finding those solutions. So if you need to stay nimble and you need to be custom, you might want to get something that can print parts really fast on demand as you need them. If you are um, being driven to innovate and re reiterate and need a whole slew of design options and maybe Polyjet and SLA, you, that's what you need because that's what's important to your business. Um, th these technologies really all fill gaps. If you have questions about this, uh, feel free to kind of jump in and, and ask about them but uh, these are where we see them fitting. They, of course, can blend from one place to another, but uh, this is kind of a general view that we have. So that's it for me. I really appreciate you listening to me. Um, I welcome any questions. I'll go ahead and throw up my email uh, and my phone number if, you, if we're not doing questions right now or if you're not in a place where you can do a question. Certainly reach out to me directly. Very excited. Um, about what the future holds for automotive and what the future holds for additive specifically with Stratasys, we're really making some investments to, uh, to have a portfolio that's completely unmatched. So I want to thank you for your time. Look forward to hearing from you. Thank you.